Jackie and I'm the Makerspace Manager at Swarthmore College and this is part of our webinar series that we are doing uh, during our COVID-19 quarantine and I'm very happy to uh, have this exciting webinar today on something we can all do at home from our kitchens brought to us by Tara Webb, our costume shop manager here at Swarthmore. So um, I will be kind of hanging out on the sidelines and keeping an eye on the chat if anyone has questions they want to ask on the side. Otherwise, I will hand it off to Tara and let her take over from here. Sure. Thank you, Jackie, for hosting us. I'm excited. This is um, kind of the first format that I've done this um, kind of webinar situation from my kitchen. So that's cool. Um, I basically today I was going to do um, because we're obviously not all coming into this with the same materials as we would in a class uh, a little bit of a lecture demo um, set up so I'll first I'll walk you through the processes uh, of what the basics are to, to use um, food scraps from your kitchen to do some dye work and painting I also I like to paint with it um, the, the materials as well and then, um, and then I'll, I'll, I have some, a few things here I can demo for you, but then I'll basically just kind of open the floor to questions that you might have, because there's a lot of different, um, the cool, the thing that I find so wonderful about natural dyes is that the, um, there's a lot of experimentation. So you have to kind of approach this whole process as an experiment about what you have available to you, and also as an opportunity to, um, think about the colors of your environment and that's that's it's kind of um, what I have um, uh, that's my approach to it so I just want to like put that out there for everybody else as well and I'm sorry I'm a little backlit by our kitchen lighting but <laughs> I have a lot of control over that at the moment. No one has good light in the kitchen do they? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so I put together a slideshow um, for you, which I will I'll I'll screen share in just a second, and I can also send this to everyone when at, um, when you're done because it has um, some basic recipes and formulas. It's a pretty um, non-complicated thing, and um, I love this because it's an opportunity to you know save all those things that um, you know you might not you might just put them in the trash, like for example onion skins. Um, so the, there's some great, the kitchen is like a great place to start with natural dyes if you, if this is something that you're interested in. Um, there's a lot of other ways to approach it too. There's all kinds of plant materials in the world and um, out in your environment. Um, but the kitchen is like, I feel like a really accessible place for everyone. And it's great to do with kids too, because you're working with non-toxic um, materials. Um, so I'm going to, let me get this. Um, um, the, my slideshow set up here. Does anybody out there have experience or have, have you, anybody, has anybody done anything with natural dyes that they would care to share with us? I know some of you have had me in other, or come to some of my other workshops, so. I have not. I remember as a kid when we wanted to dye eggs, we uh, mixed vinegar and water and dropped a little dye tablet in there and it would fizz mm -hmm. and then we would use that. But that's, that's my only experience. That's the, um, that's actually um, the idea for um, me doing this today came up, came with that because it was right around Easter and I was like, oh, you know, I'll, um, let me just dive some eggs and I'll take pictures and doc document it because this is such an easy thing to do. Um, uh, I'm, and uh, let's see, so I think we can go ahead and get started unless anybody else has something to share about natural dyes. Not so much, not so much today. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, this is the... Here we go. Um, this is the, my slide, this is my stove behind me. Um, and this is the setup that I did for the natural dyes. And I also, um, I have saved some of those dyes in the refrigerator, um, which I'll show you at the end. And you can see what they look like um, on some fabric. <clears throat> um, some of them, I have some pictures that I will also show you of the eggs that I did. And I did two different kinds of eggs. Um, 
Uh, I did regular like hard boiled eggs for Easter and I also did some darning eggs. I don't know if anybody's used a darning egg before, but basically um, it's a small wooden egg that you can use to darn socks because it helps you wrap the, the heel of the sock over the, um, over a, like a round surface so you can fix holes in socks more readily. Um, and I'll show you those at the end as well. Um, so the first thing to talk about is that this is not a fast process. I like to this, think of this as slow art, um, <laughs> mostly because it takes you a little bit of time to gather the materials, for example. Um, you, you can use like small amounts of materials that you can find throughout your kitchen, but it also, the, the, the rule is for one pound of fabric, say a t-shirt, you want one pound of material. Um, so if you're talking like onion skins or something, that's quite a bit of material if you're thinking about it. But you can still do small amounts, and I'll, I'll, sh I'll talk about that as we go too. Um, the other thing to know is that natural dyes can be very unpredictable because they're, they're very pH sensitive, which means that if you have hard water or soft water, you're going to see different results. Um, and also it depends on what you're dyeing. So I, for um, our demo purpose to, purposes today, I dyed some wood, um, these wooden eggs, and I also dyed some actual eggs, and I also have some fabric here. So those are all different materials, and they will take dye differently depending on, um, depending on like lots of different factors. Um, I don't recommend using the same pots and utensils for dye projects that you use for cooking and eating, although in this particular demo you can. We're not using anything that's toxic. Um, but it's just a good idea to have like separate art things and separate cooking and kitchen things just so you don't get confused accidentally, especially with dye, um, natural dyes, a lot of the materials are the same. So you, you just want to make sure you have a division. Um, the other thing that I recommend because we're all working at home is work safely and be, be neat as you go because you don't want to um, leave something for your roommate to clean up or for, you don't want to have a project with your kids where there's, you know, end up with beet ju juice all over the walls or, you know, something along those lines. Um, and so, and, and I also think it helps to just remain, you know, stay organized as you're working along. And because this is a slower process, we have the opportunity to, to do that a little bit more carefully because there's no rush, basically. Um, and then finally, the nice thing about um, using um, these uh, food scraps is that they would end up in the con compost anyway. So if you have a compost, basically you're subverting the compost um, materials before um, you're like using them and then they go in the compost and they still break down, but you get a second life out of them. So you're using things that would like naturally end up in the garbage anyway. You just get to make some art with it. Um, so those are the things to know before you start. This is the, um, the ba some like basic knowledge about natural dyes and I'm, I'll go over these really quickly but um, when you get the slideshow later you, we can, you can um, have go do a little bit more research if you want but the b natural dyes work best with natural fabric so you like you want to have things that have like a pretty high co cotton content or linen content. Um, some rayons and nylons will work because rayon is actually made out of um, a grass, so it has a natural um, fiber, which a lot of people don't know. Um, and nylon also can be made out of um, a plant material. So those are two, those are two like sometimes not considered like not natural, but they are. Um, and they also, uh, natural dyes also work really well with wool and silk. Um, Fabrics like polyester and acrylic will not take dyes very well because they're made out of plastic and they're meant to, um, that plastic is usually meant to bond. Like if you're doing a, a color dye with polyester, you're going to want a, a special plastic dye for that polyester fabric. Um, it also works really well with wood and, and paper, which are cellulose materials. And um, so they're similar, wood and paper are similar to cotton and linen that way. Um, in order, unlike like a dye you would buy in the grocery store, you need uh, something that helps to bind the color to the fabric. And in, um, in dyeing land, that term is called mordant, a mordant. And mordant means to bite because of how the, um, how the material, the mordant material helps chemically integrate the color to the fabric. Mordants are generally metals 
um, and most often they're available in powder form that you dissolve in the water and um, a lot of them are really like have high toxicity like you don't want to handle copper and tin because it's really they're harsh on your skin and so we're not using um, traditional mordants in this particular process but it's important to know because this is what helps the color stay on the fabric longer and that's one of the things to know about natural dyes in general is that they tend to fade over time and they react to sunlight a lot more readily than say um, something that you would buy in the store but i find them kind of amazing that way because it gives you the opportunity to dye them again so you have this opportunity to have like a second life of something when you're doing um, something with the natural dyes um, for this particular process like i said you don't need a mordant and sometimes you don't need a mordant at all a lot of plants um, and a lot of things we find in our kitchen have natural tannins in them and if you um if you don't know what a tannin is, it's the kind of thing that makes you pucker when you have like drink black tea by itself or you have red wine. There's sort of this like metallic -y taste. Um, and a lot, so, so there's a lot of really um, great materials that are um, uh, uh, have natural tannins in them. And one of the cool ones I think is avocado seeds. If everybody eats avocado seeds and, and the peels have tannins in them. And when you make the eye from avocados, it's pink or red. So you get these beautiful pinks and reds from avocado seeds, which is surprising. <clears throat> um, you can also, also use things in your kitchen to help act as fixatives for your natural dyes. And that includes salt, vinegar, baking soda, soy milk, and almond milk. Um, soy milk has a really long history in the natural dye processes and has been used in Japan for a long time. And one of the things that's really great about soy milk is basically it coats the fabric in a protein that helps the um, dye integrate into the fabric more readily. So it's really fun to play with soy milk if you don't, if you don't have a soy milk allergy, but um, it's also like you can, um, in this process, and I'll go over that in a little bit, is um, you can make your own soy milk as part of the process. So if, and it's very, you know, it's like not a toxic, um, uh, <clears throat> material like some of the other mordants that are there. Um, and the last thing I'll just mention is that modifiers are your friends. And modifiers, um, natural dyes, as I was saying before, are really sensitive to pH. So if you've ever done a pH um, test with um, in chemistry class where you take cabbage juice and you add acid and it changes color, <clears throat> a, natural, a lot of natural dyes will respond the same way. So for example, um, if you dye an egg with uh, red cabbage, um, and you'll, I'll show you a picture in just a little bit, um, <clears throat> the egg will come out blue, um, like a teal blue. Um, but you can shift the pH to um, a more reddy, pinky, purpley by adding an acid. So if you've ever um, experimented with that, so those sort of pH shifts, um, that, that can be really fun as you start to experiment more with natural dyes. And that, those most often occur with the reds and blues in the natural dye ranges. Um, so that's just a little bit of like terminology that you need to know. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, a little frog in my throat. So these are the basic steps for um, doing natural dyes in your kitchen. And like I said, it's really not that complicated. There's just a little bit of background information um, that you have to go into it knowing about. So the first step is to wash your fabric and prepare it to be dyed or to prepare the thing that you wanna be dyed. Uh, for example, when I did the darning eggs, I, I washed them really well, I scrubbed them a little bit and then I soaked them overnight in a, in a bath that had some pickling alum in it. Um, pickling alum is a um, milder version of a mordant that you can use, but it, because it's food safe, um, it, you, it, I consider it a kitchen, kitchen dye uh, material. Um, so you want to wash your fabric and then gather your materials. And that's um, things that you can find in your kitchen. Like, for example, um, maybe there's some cranberries in your freezer that are left over from Thanksgiving and they're really old and frostbitten or blueberries, that's another good one. Um, onion skins, both yellow onion skins and red onion skins make uh, different colors. Um, some old wilted spinach, 
you might have, or maybe some parsley that's like dying in a in a drawer in your in your refrigerator. Um, you can also use like like uh, the freezer is always a good place to check if you have like things that are frostbitten, plant materials that are frostbitten, like um, maybe some frozen carrots, or um, I'm trying to think of some other things. Uh, and, or and, and then other uh, other things to check out would be like if you get some carrots at the grocery store and they have carrot tops still on them if you can use those carrot tops for a dye or beets you know the beet shavings beets are a little tricky because you think they make a really good dye but they're it's a little they're a little like they don't want to dye things <laughs> they work better as paints um, <clears throat> So once you gather your materials, you're bas basically going to put, put those materials with some boiling water. And that usually takes about like half an hour. Um, so I have some um, things here and I'm going to turn on my other camera. Let's see if this works. It's real quickly, Tara. Yeah. Um, someone had a question. What is the, do you know what the ideal pH is for having the color set in the fabric? It depends on the fabric. Um, in general, protein fibers, like, um, that's a really technical question, but in general, protein fibers and, um, like, wool and silk, like a more acidic bath, and cotton and linen, like a more basic bath. So, um, that's like a, just a generality, but there's no, you, like, there's a lot of books out there about, like, what the exact pH would be, but I would just tell you that if you're going to do something with wool or silk, add a little bit of vinegar, like, and that's one of the reasons, like Jackie mentioned, using vinegar in, um, in, like, the egg dyeing process, if you're doing, like, Easter eggs, because eggs are, uh, you know, that's a protein base, their, their shell has a protein in it and the vinegar actually helps the dye get absorbed into that um, material. Um, let me see if this is working. I'm not sure if it is, but maybe this. Um, oh yeah, there we go. Here's my, this is my, these are um, some leftover dyes. If you look, um, here's my second video down there. If you, I had to scroll down, but these are, um, this is red onion skin and yellow onion skin. And so basically um, when I like to dye, dye at home, I like to use just like a quart canning jar um, or like a, this um, is a pickle jar. I think, we're, I think we're still just seeing the, the main screen that you shared the first yeah. time. Yeah, you have to, I'm a participant. So you have to find me as a second participant on there. Oh, I see. I yeah, see. yeah. Um, so when so making your dye basically means adding. It's like a two to one ratio. Basically, you have materials, and then you add water and boil the boil the that water, simmer it for thirty minutes. Um, there's a couple of things like with beans. Um, black beans make a really beautiful purple dye, and you don't need to boil those. You can actually, like, if you're strain, if you're um, going to cook beans that are not in a can, and you have those, you know, hard kind of little beans that you have to soak overnight. If you use that, so if you save that soaking water, that will actually make these really beautiful blues and purples and grays. Um, uh, I don't know if I have. I might have a photo somewhere, but. Um, I don't currently have any material that's been dyed with black beans. Um, but you don't need to cook the beans in order to get that color. You can just strain off the soaking water. And red rice, there's lots of other, like some of those black rices and wild rice, you can get some colors just from like soaking the dry, the, the dry thing in it. And I will um, frequently, even with um, things like onion skin, sometimes you can just pour, pour boiling water over the material and then let it sit overnight and um, and you'll get some color that way too. Um, so depending on so depending on what your your materials are, eggs, you know, um, a wooden spoon, a t-shirt, the next step is basically to soak your um, materials in your dye bath uh, overnight or you can use it for paint and we're gonna um, I'll show you some of that at the end too. 
and basically you let you soak it in there you can leave it in there for up to a week if you wanted to depending on what kind of color you want it to get um, I usually do overnight just because that's easy and I'm impatient and I want to just get it out and you know see what it did um, but uh, we've I've also done workshops with the students um, where we've just done it in an afternoon so even a minimum of 30 minutes and you'll get some color out of the materials um and so basically when you're done with that you rinse and then you're ready to go you can use your your materials uh, um you know enjoy your t-shirt or your eggs or um your darning egg <laughs> or any of those things um let me go let me i'm just gonna um step off screen here for a second and get the eggs and i'll put those on my screen too Yeah, there we go. Um, okay, so so the first the first thing, if you've never done any natural dyeing, one of the, the things that's really important is that you um, a lot of material fabric and and even things like these wooden eggs have um, they have like oil residue from our hands and different kinds of waxes and sizing to keep the fabric, like if you have a new t-shirt. So you wanna wash the fabric really well um, in a, on a 30 minute, minute cycle with mild detergent. You can also do it by hand. Um, and the reason to do that is to get rid of some of those, those um, waxes and detergents and things that come on new fabric. The uh, great thing about using things that are older, like, um, I have a friend who does a lot of work with uh, vintage silk slips, is that you don't have to worry quite so much about that because the older the material, the, the less waxes and <laughs> detergents and things they have on them. So ju just keep that in mind. That's one of the things that I say with people um, with rayon and nylon, especially stuff that you've had for a long time, it, it usually dyes really well. Um, when you're washing you want to use the hottest water that, that's safe for the fabric and you want to be careful if you're using silk or wool as you know they'll shrink so usually cottons and linens i say like wash it in hot and then with wool and silk just you know kind of swish it around and hand wash it to get some of the oils off of the, the fabrics and rinse it thoroughly when you're done um, the next thing to do is to prepare your binder or your fixative and it varies um like if you and i include the option of doing a binder or fixative because you don't have to do a mordant in this particular case but I, I'm including that information here if you do happen to have some pickling alum in your cabinet from some pickling project you can definitely use that as a fixative and you're going to want to soak your clean washed fabric in this binder or fixative overnight uh, the great thing about um, the you know process is like if you're still gathering dye materials you can soak your binder or your fixative for several days as long as you can keep it someplace where it's not going to spoil it's like so for example if you're using soy milk you want to keep it someplace where it's not going to clump and get sour um usually in the fridge but if you're using something like vinegar or salt which are two of the main fixatives that you can use you don't need to worry about that as much because they're not going to spoil necessarily um, but you just want to keep keep it someplace cooler like a garage or um, a basement or your your refrigerator if you have the room um, and and then when you're ready to die you can just take out your water your your materials and um, and then go straight to the dye baths uh, you can also dry the fabric after you've put it in the binder or the fixative but you don't have to do that um, I usually like to do everything in one day, so I like to do this all at once. Um, but there's, you know, you know um, there's some advantages if you're like trying to save up some onion skins for a particular color or something like that. Um, if you want to do something with wood, I, I just suggest washing it with soap and then soak it overnight in a fixative. And the, the fixatives just help the wood uptake the, fab, the dye material a little bit better. Um, let's see where I went. I skipped one, sorry. Uh, these are the ratios, and I'm not gonna go into too much in depth here, other than, and because you'll see this here, but basically um, the, the, the main fixatives that we can use are salt and 
um, vinegar. Generally, salt works better when you're using something like blueberries or blackberries, and vinegar works, works better with vegetables, but it's kind of, it's one of those things where you have to experiment because it really depends on what kind of water you have. Um, my parents, for example, who live in the mountains in North Carolina have a really neutral water, I found, and the water here in Swarthmore is a little bit um, on the, the higher acidic side, um, which can be advantageous when you're doing natural dyes to have a slightly more acidic water. Um, you can also use a food safe alum. I don't, has anybody used alum? Maybe. And so alum um, is like, uh, again, it's like a, I think the chemical term is potassium sulfate or something like that, but it's often used in pickling to keep your cucumbers crisp. Um, so you can almost, uh, most of the time you can find it in the grocery store. And the, the basic recipe for alum is 10% um, of alum to the weight of your object. So usually if I'm doing something at home, I happen to have a kitchen scale. So I'll just kind of get a guesstimate of, of what the weight might be. Um, and, and you use the pickling alum the same way that you would um, uh, salt or vinegar and you soak your item in it overnight and then you're ready to die. Um, the, the thing, I've been experimenting more with the soy milk um, it, uh, binder thing, um, which is really fun because the other thing that soy, makes soy milk really easy is that you can just use straight up soy milk with the dyes to create paint. So if you wanted to paint on a fabric rather than do like a tie dye or dye the whole fabric, you would um, you make some soy milk or buy some soy milk and then you can actually just add it to the dye material to, to your dyes in your jars and then that will the protein in the soy milk will help the paint bind to the um to the fabric more readily um the ratio um for making soy milk is um it's you soak one cup of dried soybeans overnight in three to four cups of water and then you strain the water and you grind the beans with an, a new four cups of water in a blender or a food processor and you strain it and that's what um this is what i was doing here i was doing a big batch but basically um when you're left you have this you know nice frothy white soy milk and you have this soy milk crumble which you can still cook with it's still edible if you like to eat soybeans um there's a lot of really great um you know asian and middle eastern recipes that have soy crumble in them and it's a really nice high protein thing it's totally edible it's not all you've done is soaked it in water so it's it's not um shouldn't go to waste um and and you can use those soybeans, you can grind them like three or four times and get like a lot of soy milk just from one cup of soybeans. And there's a, there's a great um, um, artist in California, his name is John Marshall. And I highly recommend checking him out if you're interested in the soybean natural dye processes because he studied in Japan with these master craftsmen who use soy as both a binder for dyes and also as a what's called a resist technique where they do these really complicated OB um, and kimono patterns um, on fabrics using just soy milk and natural dyes and his almost all of the information I have comes from him and he's he's really great about sharing the information on the internet so if you have more if you're interested in this process then check it out. Um, I do think that I've used um, high quality store-bought soy milk, but the, th the th tricky thing about using store-bought soy milk, and you can also use almond milk, is that there's usually additives in soy milk and almond milk, like sugar, salt, um, some kind of preservative, and they will affect the natural dye process, so it's they're often not as effective as if you make your own. But I do like to give it as an option because you can, if you're doing like a big, you know, the, some of the workshops I've done, 20 to 30 people, and that's a lot of soy, soy milk, so it's easier to buy a bulk, um, a few gallons, and, you know, dilute it a little bit. And you can still get a pretty good result that way. It's just not quite um, as powerful, I think, as just your, your homemade soy milk. 
Um, and as I mentioned, you can also use almond milk and there's, there's a lot more information about um, that out in the world now than there used to be, but soy milk is like the main one because it's been, they've been using soy milk as a binder for paints, for fabric paints in Japan for um, hundreds, hundreds more years than, than we have here in the States. Um, so there's my soy milk. This was from the summer at my parents. Um, I like to do color processing wherever I go. So <laughs> I'm always, I have, usually I'm carrying around a bag of soybeans with me. Um, the next step is to gather your materials. And these are the materials that I use for making my um, eggs. And uh, so I have um, some red onion skin, some yellow onion skin. I had some kind of wrinkly blueberries that were starting to go kind of gross in the fridge. And I had some beets. Um, and I'll show you those in just a second. But this is the, um, the beet on wood is this really nice pink, um, pinky color. Um, I have gotten some weird results with beets. Um, the joke in natural dye world is that everything makes yellow. And so I've, I've actually had beets make yellow um, on fabric. And um, it's kind of an amazing thing. But beets work best as a paint or as like some on, a, on this kind of, you know, situation where you're not, um, uh, you don't have to, uh, you can let it soak for a long time. Because I let these soak for like two days. Um, this on the wood was um, the red onion skin, which actually is this really, really rich brown brownie color, but it will, red onion skin I've, I can, does a range of things. It can actually go um, olive green in, in some situations um, and, and will also make sort of a ready purple. And then this was the cabbage, um, which is the color that you'll get if you, if you were just to put um, a, a regular egg in, in a jar of cabbage dye you would get this blue. It has to do with the pH of the egg. I'm not really 100% sure why that is, but you always get teal blue when you do red cabbage. Um, in this case with the wood, I, I changed the pH by adding baking soda to get this teal with the wood. Because um, uh, naturally it'll be a much more bluer, bluer shade. Um, this is the yellow onion skin, which is this usually pretty typical. It's like a br brilliant, beautiful, orangey yellow. Um, and this scarf that I'm wearing right now is yellow onion skin and it's got a little bit of turmeric in there as well. Um, so this is like a different example of what you can get with yellow. Um, this is pretty typical for a blueberry. It's kind of a rich bluey purple. Um, and on fabric this will even be more blue rather than purple. And I think those were the colors that I used for my egg dyes and, and I saved some of the um, onion skin for the um, to show you paints in just a second here, but, uh, I made a, I made a list and we don't have to memorize all these now, but I just wanted to go through these, um, uh, kind of quickly. If you see on the right here, that's the pink that you can get from avocado. Um, those are shirts that the students did a couple years ago in one of my workshops. Um, other, other foods that you can use that will make reds and pinks are listed here. So there's um, typically things that you would think of like cherries, pomegranate seeds, strawberries, plum skins, raspberries. Um, purple cabbage, if you want to make it more pink, you just add vinegar and then it becomes a more pink dye. Um, and the same is true with uh, cranberries, if you add more, a little bit of acidity, it'll become more pink. Um, beets and beet tops, as I said, work best on paper or wood to get that pinky color that we know from beets. Otherwise, it, they tend, it tends to do really weird things um, on fabric. You want it to stain, but it, it just doesn't make it that much. Um, yellows, there's um, the uh, common one is turmeric that makes some beautiful yellows. Also pomegranate peels, bay leaves, carrots, carrot tops, citrus peels. That's one of my favorite. If you have like a bunch of oranges or lemons, you can just save them and dry them out and use them as a dye and they make some beautiful yellows as well. Um, as I said in natural dye land, um, almost everything makes yellow. So for example, if you're doing, if you just want to test out a flower, I'm almost I can almost guarantee you that it will make yellow. It's, it's one of the most common colors in, in um, natural dyes. 
Um, green is one of the most elusive colors to get in natural dyes. So a lot of dyers will, dot, will um, over dye blues with yellows. Um, but some of the thing, ways that you can get green are by um, grinding up things that have a lot of green in them in the blender, like parsley, spinach, um, plantain, uh, kale, nettles. Um, those will give you sort of some, come some kind of olivey green. And this one, um, if you if you drink super green or use green supplements in in a smoothie. Um, this is a chlorophyll supplement that I happen to have from a class that I did, and um, this is chlorophyll on linen. So it creates these really, can, you can get some really interesting greens from that. And I think this one was actually, I mixed in some turmeric because we, we wanted it more of a spring green. Um, so those are some ways to get greens. Blues and purples, this is, um, you can see examples from our student um, work. There's cabbage. Cabbage will give you these blues. Um, funnily enough, in the in the dye pot, red cabbage looks very purple, but then when you pull it out, you get this kind of bluey color, and that just happens to be the the material reacting with the what you're dyeing. Um, and then blueberries, it's the same thing. Sometimes you'll get like a really purpley blue um, on paper or you know on wood, and then you'll get these more rich sort of indigo blues almost. Um, on, on fabric. Um, and then finally, these are um, browns and blacks. Are, black is another hard color to make in natural dye land. Uh, the most common way to get it is um, by adding iron to something that has tannins in it. So for example, black walnut hulls, which are, if you're on campus, they're those big green balls that are out in front of, um, I think there's a tree in front of the Langs um, Center, and there's some others on campus, but black walnut um, makes some beautiful dark browns and blacks, and um, so does hickory, and there's a, there's a hickory tree right by um, Tarbell and Clothier, and that made, made this um, sample that's on the right there. Um, and uh, so you can get some really nice browns from nut trees often, and from tea, tea and coffee is another place where there's um, some some really nice browns and blacks. Um, the other, the older old school thing for um, when I was uh, talking about adding iron is people used to make dyes in an iron pot, like a cast iron pot, and iron does this thing called saddening, which um, t which is um, changes the chemical nature of the dyes and will and will bring everything down to this like muted brown gray color. So for example, if you add iron to an avocado dye bath that will go completely gray. So you'll get like grays and blacks from avocado. And a lot of times you'll see people who are working with um, uh, like steaming plants. I don't know if anybody's seen that, but where you take leaves from your yard and you steam it in a steamer and they're using an iron uh, as a mordant because iron also acts as a mordant. It's just really hard on the materials so I don't like using it very often because it's um, it's it's has a it's not great to be around for long periods of time um, even though it's good for us. Um, so making your dyes again I will just go over this I mentioned this before, but the general, generally a good ratio is one pound fabric to one pound food waste. Um, so if you're doing a t-shirt, you're going to want like, a, you know, like a pretty good handful of material um, if you want like a really strong color. The more plant material you have, the, the stronger the color, and the more material you use, um, the, the more material you can process, the better your, the richer your color will, will be. You'll, the richer your color will be. Um, for soft, softer things like spinach or berries, I like to mash them up or blend them in the blender because it helps release all of the, that material from the leaves or the, the plant. Um, and so you're gonna, some, you're gonna mix your material with water and then heat it up for 30 minutes to an hour and then strain it and put it in a glass jar. And that's what, um, the, what I have here is some onion skins. Um, that I heated and strained 
And you can actually get several uses out of this, which is why it's not, I like to keep them in jars and then stick them in the fridge. <clears throat> um, and again, as I mentioned, if you're using something like black beans or black rice, like forbidden rice that gives some really nice purples, you don't have to cook those. You can just use the straining water if, you're, if you want to strain them for a little while. <clears throat> um, this is just my little setup from when I was doing uh, the different eggs. Just wanted to sh show you an example. Um, this was in the summer, you can see I've got some dye baths going here, and this, this was just some, some stuff from my parents' garden. <clears throat> Um, and you can leave your materials in your dye baths for <clears throat> a pretty long time, or you can add your, you can dye with them and then add soy milk and use a binder and use them as paint, or you can, um, you know, just keep dyeing with them until the, you start to see, things will get lighter and lighter the more you dye with it, um, because the, you know, the molecules from the dye materials are bonding with the, the fabric or whatever it is that you're using. Um, so, and lastly um, is basically, I think, is that, is that it? These are, yeah, <laughs> this last slide is kind of silly. It's basically, you're, you know, once you've gotten things to where you want them, um, usually what I like to do is let it dry overnight and before I wash it and just look to let the uh, dye sit on the material a little bit longer and then wash it cold on soap. Um, again, some things to remember is that some colors won't last forever and they'll fade the more you wash them. Um, and, and it's still, you know, I still think that's fun. Um, and then these are some samples of some things that I, that I've done over the years. I just wanted to show you before I show you a, a demo, <clears throat> but, um, these were the, the eggs, that the hard-boiled eggs that I did. Um, and, and then this, these are the wooden eggs, which are also in the bowl here. And you can see these, this, this is like right out of the, the dyes. Um, this is some black walnut. You can see it's, um, it's got a sort of a brownie, brownie gray feeling. The piece of fabric that's in the front is silk, and you can sort of see that there's a different quality between the, the cotton and the silk, the cotton t-shirts behind it and the silk in front. Um, and then some of the other uh, objects on the right are from workshops that I've done with students at Swarthmore that are um, painted, uh, painted natural dye paints. And basically it's just, um, all we did was add soy milk as a binder to the paints and then paint it on onto some different materials. And you can see you get like a the colors are kind of muted. Um, you can get a more concentrated color if you use more dye plants. Um, and that's basically my lecture <laughs> natural dyes. <laughs> so um, what I'd like to do now is uh, I can certainly answer some questions, but I can also show you what some of these dyes look like in real life um, <clears throat> for a minute on some different materials. I have some paper and a cotton handkerchief here and um, and some silk. So that's great. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. Someone was great. asking about um, if if someone can you like what kinds of flowers people can use um, if there are flowers like daffodils and tulips sort of like yeah. at the end of their um, their life for the season can those be used? Yes, absolutely. Um, flowers, one of the things you want to make sure is that they're not um, particularly toxic to use. I know daffodil, daffodils, some people are, can get allergic to the sap that's in daffodils, so just use flowers with caution, um, unless you know it's something that's like relatively, you're not going to have an allergic reaction to it. Um, Food plants are always good, like if you're using, um, if you know that the, like nasturtiums, for example, are edible as well. And so you just want to use flowers with caution, but you can certainly make paint with them. I just wouldn't recommend handling them a lot or you, like, if you're going to make um, a dye plant, just make sure that it's, you know, you don't personally have an allergic reaction to it. Um, the, you can, um, if, you, if you're not sure, I always recommend making a paint and then doing a little research on the flower. 
because it's still fun to paint with daffodils and tulips and things that are around. Um, and I often will save, like if somebody gives me a bouquet of flowers, I'll save the flowers and dry them and then use them as a paint for a painting process later, just because it's nice, you know, it's a nice thing to do with, with um, plant materials that you have. So yeah, great question. Someone's also asking, um, would this kind of thing work on leather, since that's kind of a protein material? Yeah, leather is a great, um, um, is a great thing to experiment with. I would say in the thing about this is it's a pretty hefty water-based process. So I would make sure that you know what you're doing with the leather because leather tends to harden when it gets wet. Um, so just know, like I would do, a, make sure you are using it as a paint or using a water light process. Um, just so that like you understand like how to re-soften it because that's a whole thing with leather um, as a protein But they do take natural dyes very well. There's some great companies out there that are doing some really interesting work with with dyeing um, leather with natural dyes um, I also had a question at the beginning of the presentation. I forget what you called it, but um the the things that help sort of bond the the metals that help bond the dyes to the, the fabric mordants, mordants. Yeah. um if i have like like i have some hunks of aluminum in my basement if i threw that in the batch would that help yeah. it at all yes oh, okay that can actually uh, like for example um you can actually throw like you know a handful of pennies in a dye bath and that will change Copper, for example, copper is really good for getting green, and that, but it's also not great to wear on your skin for long periods of time, which is why it's not a commonly used um, mordant in, in natural dye, dyes anymore, because um, people learned that, like, in the Victorian times, that if you wore things that were copper green, you would get, you know, you would start to get, like, skin irritations and things like that. But throwing a handful of pennies in your dye bath will sometimes push the, the dye colors in a different direction. Just as if like you, if you had some like iron nails, you know, that's, that's a common way to like do a mild um, mordant for, um, for something. But if you're using iron again, like know that it's gonna make things black and gray because it saddens things. But there, that's a really great, like you can, I, I have a great aluminum pot, which I love. It's like a 50 gallon um, crab steamer or something. And it's a great pot for doing natural dyes in because it really helps the fabric um, take that those dyes better, even if I don't use a mordant. So you can use a use a pot like, or a copper pot. That's another way, you know, if your pot is made of a particular material. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Um, and Mike is asking, does yarn dye well? And if so, how do you manage parts of the process like washing um, before and after you dye? Um, if you're talking about like, like wool yarn, I'm assuming. Um, yes, yarn is a great, if you're a knitter or a spinner, uh, yarn dyes really well. Um, and you just have to do the thing that's the, the wash it and uh, the, as is best for the yarn. For example, usually when I'm doing a wool process, I'll um, wash it in warm water, get it prepped, dye it, and make sure I'm not, um, you have to keep the temperature in, when you're doing wools um, at a lower temperature, for example. Like with cotton, I don't care, I'll just boil, boil the water and it can be hot and it's fine. But with wools, you want to be a little careful, otherwise you'll like felt the wool. So you can totally do, um, do yarns and, and get some beautiful things from yarns, but just, you know, make sure that you're using the temperature that's correct for those baths. And you can certainly do a cold, um, cold bath or do it like a solar dye. Um, and a solar dye is basically you get your dye materials ready to go and then you stick your yarn or your fabric in there and then you just leave it on your porch for a week. <laughs> and then in a sunny situation, or, you know, even 24 hours, like on a sunny day, a sunny summer day, and um, you can get some great, great colors that way. Um. Um, I had one more question. Sure. 
Do you think it's possible to um, get a stronger concentration of your dye by um, like sort of cooking it down as a reduction or um, evaporating some of the water out of it or does that affect it? Um, it does, um, sorry, my partner just came in because there's a huge storm coming through right now. So if I lose power, I'm sorry. Um, the, yes, I, the, if you do a reduction, like you would if you were like boiling something, boiling the water off, yes, you can actually get more concentrated um, color. And that's especially, especially, I like to reduce things if I'm doing a paint because the more watery, just like watercolor, the more watery the dye bath is, the more watery result you'll have. And the more you can reduce, um, if, you're, if I'm doing a dye paint situation, um, I'll reduce the water by at least half. So if you basically you just leave your dye material in the water for, you know, at a simmer for half an hour, um, and it'll start to reduce, just leave the lid off and it'll start to reduce down and reduce down. Um, so, and that's a great way to extract color from, um, from things, especially like onion skins are so giving, they will just give color forever. And avocado seeds and pits, I've done the, um, when we did the avocado dye workshop, um, we, I think I, we did about 50 shirts and I was still getting color from this, you know, big, you know, 10 gallon bucket of av avocado. Um, and the, I mean, and that was the other fun thing about the avocados is, you know, I, I certainly don't eat that many avocados. So I just ask people to save the pits and seeds for me. And a lot of times what I'll do is just throw that stuff in the freezer, um, like I'm saving it for stock and then, um, and then I'll bring it out and chop it up and use it as a dye. So for example, the cabbage that I used for the eggs, um, it was like a quarter cabbage of red cabbage that had been sitting in my drawer for like a week and was kind of wrinkly. So I just froze that. And then when I went to do the dyes, I just chopped it up and used it. So it really even wasn't that much. It was only like, you know, a quarter of a cabbage. It was like a little handful, but there was a lot of, got a lot of dye out of it. Okay, well, does anyone else have any questions before we wrap up the webinar? No? All right. Well, thank you so much, Tara. This has been really informative and uh, I'm excited to get started collecting materials in my kitchen and I hope everyone else is. So, sure. um, thank you for giving us this uh, wonderful information and thank everybody else for joining us today and please continue to check in and stay tuned for more programming from the Makerspace. Yeah, thank you so much, Jackie. I appreciate it. Thank you.